I believe that our orgasmic experience includes our physical, our mental, emotional, spiritual, energetic selves, and that it's not only about pleasure, but rather our orgasmic experience is a portal to our full awakening and aliveness in these human bodies. That's amazing and juicy. And I think that that perspective is one that not a lot of people have. They're, they're chasing pleasure or they're, uh, at least from my perspective of what I see when people talk about orgasms and sex and online, there's a lot of, um, well, how do I have just a bigger orgasm or a better orgasm? Or how do I even orgasm? Because maybe they haven't before uh, women with their partners, right? And um, so tell me more about seeing it as an experience beyond just pleasure and uh, how that can impact your life. Yes, absolutely. And so, of course, there is pleasure and bliss and ecstatic yeah. states and, and like the most delicious experiences we can have in a human body inside of orgasms. And I believe that holding a perspective that there can only be pleasure inside of our orgasmic experience actually limits the orgasm and the pleasure that is possible because so much of the orgasmic experience is opening and surrendering and allowing life and energy to move move through and sometimes that involves feelings of insecurity or heartbreak or anger or unprocessed emotions that are stored in our tissues that actually are being woken up to be released, to be alchemized, to be healed, to be transmuted into pure, raw, creative energy. And that happens inside of this most vulnerable, sacred connection that we have with ourselves or with another person or a group of people, depending on what you're into. But ultimately, that space that is opened is one of the most vulnerable places that we can actually access as human beings, I believe. And so when we can include more of a full range, it not only increases pleasure, but it actually allows us to become a more integrated human being with an integrated sexuality. So our sexuality isn't something that exists over here that's like, I'm only allowed to have positive feelings and pleasure inside of that and anything else is wrong, right? And it, it can actually become an integrated part of ourselves where we're experiencing subtle flow of erotic energy throughout our day, where when we're crying and heartbroken, we can still experience a subtle flow of erotic energy. When we're angry at our partner or we're feeling down at ourselves, we can even find this subtle flow of arrows of life force of sensation in those times because we haven't uh, sequestered our erotic experience to being only pleasure, only in the bedroom, and only in these particular ways. Right. And before we started recording, you mentioned something about uh, multiple types of orgasms. Is that is how does that come into play here with this conversation specifically about? turning on your life force. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think I want to just back up a little bit and, and start with where a lot of people might be in this moment, yeah. which is where I started, which is I grew up in a very traditional Christian home where nobody talked about orgasms. Or, it, you know, that, that wasn't a discussion, pleasure, eros, like none of that was really on the table for discussion. And so I felt disconnected from my own body and the potential of what it could do. And so I went on a path of awakening and have been studying this different types of orgasmic awakening through Taoism, Tantra, and neuroscience. and uncovering other perspectives around orgasm, both from a scientific and also a mystical perspective, to really see what was possible inside of this pathway of awakening. Because I believe that this is really about the liberation of our life force and becoming truly 
embodied sovereign beings that are not just living inside of the programming that we have been fed through religion and media and culture and porn and high school sex education, because all of that is missing the real essence of intimacy and liberation and divinity and the holiness of our orgasmic nature. So as I've gone through this lifelong journey of uncovering this, the the power of our orgasm as a woman really starts inside of our service. And many women don't know that their cervix is orgasmic. Doctors, the medical industry still believes, people are still being taught in academia that the cervix is only for birthing babies and hopefully it doesn't get cancer and it's just basically numb. So it's actually controversial to know have an embodied experience of and be sharing work about cervical orgasm because a lot of doctors are not actually um, recognizing it yet. But there are studies that show that the cervix is indeed orgasmic and it's actually the most orgasmic organ in the female body, even beyond wow. the clitoris. So how did yeah, that so get twisted? Right. It, so it, it, it's, well, I mean, they just, I mean, how did it originally get twisted? Well, <laughs> female, I mean, we, we'll go back a, a, a click, right? So yeah. female orgasm has not deeply been studied. It only really started being studied in the 80s. And it was generally considered like a male orgasm, but lighter. And the truth yeah. is that the female orgasm is actually far more vast than the male orgasm, but it just hasn't actually had enough studies really funded on it for that to be proven. But there are many studies about how the cervix is orgasmic. And through, and many women, so here's what I want to say, many women have had cervical orgasms and they're not actually aware of it. Because it's not the same kind of experience as a clitoral orgasm, right? A clitoral orgasm mm -hmm. is like a 10 second localized experience that feels like an explosion. It's like a, it's like fireworks, which is similar to the male orgasm, but females have a much greater capacity to, oh, their orgasm can be more like a wave where it's like in the ocean, there's multiple waves happening at different times and there's peaks and there's valleys and there's waves and it can keep going and going. And this is what happens when the cervix is supple and open and some of the numbness and armor has, has been released and moved from the cervix. And then it can actually become orgasmic again. So what do you mean by numbness and armor? Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, numbness, numbness and armor is what happens when... You go to the gynecologist and they make casual small talk to distract you while they shove a speculum up into your pussy and you're like shocked and a little bit disembodied and you have to actually leave your body in order to have that happen. And you're 15 years old, right? There's armor that is created in an experience like that. There's armor that is created every time a hawk hits your cervix too fast when you're not ready and you clench instead of open and relax. There's armor that's created every time you say yes when you mean no. There's armor that's created every time we push through and force to get something done when we're not actually present and here for the experience. Armor is created in so many ways. And numbness is a layer that is on top of armor. So numbness means there's armor behind it that hasn't been felt. And so this is why I see our orgasmic life 
our erotic life, our intimate life as an opportunity to heal and release the layers of numbness and the layers of armor through emotions and stuck energy that are in the tissues. And I see that as the greater path to a more full orgasm. But, so how can people de begin to de-armor and unnumb that for the ladies, but also for the guys and how they could support this process? Yeah, I, lo I love that. So one thing I just want to say to the, to the men, women have so much conditioning around needing to perform that I know that men can also relate with. There's conditioning that everyone has around needing to perform, around needing to be some idealized sex god. And that the, the feminine has likely layers to release and that the greatest thing that you can do as a lover, as a husband, as a partner, is to be present and available for the full range of her erotic and orgasmic experience, even if that is not only pleasure, when that includes emotions, when that includes release and healing and energy. If she cries during an orgasm, that means you're doing it right, right? There's like a whole new program that needs to be installed around how we are making love and how we are approaching sex. And for women to really begin this practice of the armoring, they need to become compassionate, loving, and in approval of their emotional experience, of their emotional body. Because often our emotions are what is blocking our orgasm. And often feeling like we shouldn't express our emotions in front of men is then blocking our emotions, which is blocking our orgasm. And so really being able to be in that fully open, vulnerable place where true intimacy really lives is ultimately what makes the most juicy, full, enjoyable, erotic experience. And so for the men, I just want to invite a widening of the aperture of what you think is erotic, of what you think is feminine, of what you think is your woman in pleasure. Because sometimes her like guttural primal energy that sounds more like birth sounds than like nice sweet horn noises is actually her deepest pleasure. And women have been conditioned through media, through porn, through Hollywood, that their sex, their expression, their orgasm needs to look a certain way. And the way that it needs to look is often packaged and not the true full orgasmic experience. And so the more that we can be welcoming of what might be seen as intense or a lot or ugly or emotional, like all of that, that grit, it's like the grit of orgasm is often where like the deepest well of her pleasure really lies. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, you're saying a lot around like helping the, the, the men holding the space for anything and everything to come up. It's like really non-judgmental awareness and presence amongst it all. Um, but then also the wrapping up, it's like two, two conditionings need to be unconditioned at the same time because then there's also non-judgment of from the woman's side of her emotions and of her bigness and, and of showing that in front of a man. I mean, have you, ex have you experienced, I'm sure you have, like going through that process, what was that like for you to begin to open up to explore your emotions in that way and then also with a partner? You know, are there conversations that you, you've had or like what was that process like to where you've gotten to where you are now? Yeah, my process with gaining approval and compassion for 
my humanity and any expression that my humanity might manifest as really came from orgasmic practice on my own, like really working with my body, bringing in somatic awareness, bringing in nervous system work, like exploring every single millimeter of tissue inside of really my whole body, but specifically inside of my pussy. And as tension starts to release from the tissue, emotional release happens. And I found that, I mean, I've been doing this work for a long time, but the more comfortable I became with anything that my body might feel, any sound my body might make, and actually making the direct sound of what it feels like without trying to change that sound into something else, the quicker and the, the more fully whatever I was feeling could alchemize into more subtle pleasure and bliss. And so as a woman, I believe our work is in exploring our emotional range, pleasure, and our, the energetics of our bodies and our tissues on our own. And then when we have done that, there's an opportunity to bring that to a man. But I believe that ultimately this is a practice to start on our own. Um, because like you, like you shared, men have their own conditioning and it takes a level of self-awareness and maturity to be able to bring this to a man and then receive whatever he whatever experience his humanity has in in relationship with it because sometimes men are confused or they're like what what's the cervix i've never heard of that you know like or or they're like why are you crying and 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 that's these are innocent responses of someone who has not yet been initiated into the full range of the feminine but in order to initiate a man into the full range of the feminine a woman must first be initiated in herself and be able to hold that in herself without judgment and with full presence mm -hmm. right and then bringing that and and how i mean how have you seen in supporting men through this like what are things that women can do once they've gotten to that place that can support the guys out there um most of the audience listening to this is women um so you know are there are there things they can bring up there education or what how what would that even look like yeah so i love the art of becoming an invitation and what this means is sharing a desire with a lot of yes energy behind it so that the sharing of the desire feels like an invitation to give you more of the yes that you're already experiencing instead of coming out as a demand or a criticism it comes out as an opportunity for him to serve you to meet you to feel you and ultimate ultimately to see you in your full pleasure which is really what a benevolent man wants i love that i mean i'm just thinking on my own past when there's a, a request made or a desire stated from a yes energy it's like yeah because i want more of whatever that is so of course I'll show up for you and have a Superman cape on and I'll do anything. Um, so just to like highlight that for the listeners that that's, that's so accurate. Um, I want to go back a little bit. You, you had mentioned uh, in this dearming process, like emotions coming up and really the importance of connecting sound to that and sounding the feelings. You know what are what are some practices here? Because also from observation and, and many conversations i've heard women just being disconnected from their bodies entirely and not um, having an orgasm with a partner or or anything like that so this is really like a, a deep initiation into yourself you know the importance of sound and breath and could you just speak a little bit more into that bit of this orgasm comes from first being in your body and in a nervous system that feels safe 
And so many women are walking around in life in a state of fight, flight, freeze, in a state of anxiety, in a state of perpetually not feeling safe inside of their bodies. And when this state compounds over time and energy is not released, it's like a form of maintenance. In this world, there's so much stimulation and there's so much potential for stress and overwhelm and anxiety that doing somatic practice, giving your opportunity, giving your body an opportunity to really defrag and release and allow energy to move through your body is essential. And what I love about working with the cervix as a pathway to orgasm is the cervix is directly connected to the vagus nerve. The cervix actually has three nerve uh, roots inside, inside of it. And so the vagus nerve travels up through the belly, through the throat, and connects in the back of the cranium. But the root of it is in the uterus. So your cervix is actually... Problem. When you tone your cervix and you're actually toning and sounding through your cervix, we call it the cervical sigh, you are creating more space for your vagus nerve to relax. And in nervous system work, this is called safe and engaged, where you feel like you're in that flow. It's those moments where there's a subtle flow and ease in your energy where you feel most like yourself, you feel most like your power but you're relaxed. And so working with the cervix is actually directly working with the vagus nerve and the nervous system. So it's allowing women to feel more safe and engaged and relaxed while they are opening and thawing, melting the armor and the freeze and the numbness that has been stored inside of their vaginal walls. Right, I see. I, I did not know that. That's amazing. Well, how much does having the right partner play into some of this stuff? Because I know you're talking about obviously doing the work on self. And we also talked about earlier before we started recording of like calling in the right partner. But let's talk about why it's important to have the right partner in the first place for this work and what that can bring. And then I'd love for, to hear your take on uh, finding the right one or manifesting that. Mm, yeah. Mm. It's a it's a layered it's a layered question finding the right partner. Yeah. I would hope that or let me say that in another way. My recommendation for every woman is to be with a man who reveres and cherishes her feminine energy and truly wants to see her in her most lit up, highest expression of herself. And if you are with a man who doesn't care about that and you try to bring more of your pleasure or your desire to explore to him, he's likely not going to care. Because this kind of a man, I call a consumer of feminine energy. Consumer of feminine energy is a man who sees the feminine more like a drive through And he wants to get some fast food and then he wants to continue on and he doesn't really want to invest in the true thriving of the feminine. And a gardener is a man who wants to invest in the thriving of the feminine. And a gardener is someone who tends to and cares for the garden and then gets to receive the most delicious fruit that that garden bears when it is so well tended to and taken care of. And so my recommendation for women is to hold a standard within yourself of only being available to men who are gardeners of the feminine. The caveat to this is that as a woman, 
in order to be able to spot the difference between a consumer and a gardener of the feminine, you must be a gardener of your own feminine. Because as women, we can also consume our own energy, extracting from our vital life force in order to produce results, in order to be our mind's idea of successful and not give back, not really tending to, not really caring for our essence and our thriving. So if we are consuming and extracting from our own feminine energy, then we are likely to attract a reflection of that in men or not be able to tell the difference if a man is a gardener or a consumer. Another right, thing that I want to say that. about this, right. another thing I want to say about this is some men are truly gardeners inside. And they have not been given a model or a template of what it is to be a gardener. So they, they, they want to, but they don't really know how. And a woman who is fully in her tending to herself and really caring for herself deeply can invite that man into a deeper level of his own gardening. And I see this a lot in women who are in relationships where the relationship is generally loving. He's a benevolent man and he just doesn't really know how to deeply tend to the feminine. Like maybe he goes too fast in sex because he doesn't know better. Maybe he um, goes off on his own agenda of, you know, wanting to climax or wanting her to climax or, you know, and, and all of that is innocent. And he truly is a gardener. Like he has a gardener's heart. He really cares and really wants to tend to the feminine. But he hasn't really been given the proper invitation. And this is where women who are in a relationship can invite their partner into what it's like to garden themselves, what it's like to garden a woman through her own practice, through him seeing her make time for herself, through him seeing her be like, yeah, every morning for 10 minutes before I leave the bedroom, I'm going to be offering my yoni a deep level of care and presence, and I'm going to be awakening my full erotic arousal. So I'm going to need to shut the door in the morning and be with myself in this space. And he'd be like, what? And she holds that until he starts to see, wow, this woman is flowering. Like this is a peach tree that's now just delivering the most delicious peaches. And he gets to eat the peaches and he sees the benefits and the results. And he's like, wow, I also want to garden my woman because she is making that space and she is taking care of herself in this deeper way. How can I also contribute to that? So this is the way that women, through our embodiment, sets the tone for the relationship. Creates a, an invitational leadership that isn't the typical kind of leadership. It's, it's leadership through embodiment. It's leadership through being an essence. And I absolutely love that because it's, it is leadership and it is the leadership that I feel is, is needed for that invitation. And, um, again, it's an invitation and it's an embodiment that isn't necessarily a demand or telling him what to do. It's, it's a, it's a very feminine way of leading. And I really absolutely love that. And I just want to highlight that because, you know, even you saying that as a man, I would be like, yeah, of course. And I want, how do we do this more? How do I support in doing this more? And then all of a sudden, you know, that's when you can then share. Um, I, I'm curious because you mentioned, and I love this, this conversation. You mentioned um, when a woman shifts to gardening her energy, that's really when she can have discernment uh, to know if a man's a gardener or a consumer. What are some signs of a woman being a consumer of her own feminine energy and not a gardener yet? Yeah. The most common one 
that we see so often is burnout. It's what we are extracting from our own bodies to a level where we burn out and our adrenals literally fatigue and there's no more energy. That is like a garden that has been consumed and consumed and consumed and is bare and dry. And so many women have received, I, have been imprinted from the culture that they need to produce at the same level that men do. And this is just purely not sustainable, partially because we go through a cycle every month where there's sometimes where we have a lot of energy and sometimes where we don't. And also because we are physiologically different built different and really built to receive like if you even just look at our genitalia right like the feminine is built to receive and the masculine is built to penetrate like that is a very different physiological essence in that that when women are pushing through in order to try to produce try to be valuable try to be seen try to be loved in all of these ways that are not actually really honoring the inner garden, like really honoring our deepest self and what we really need without really holding ourselves as sacred and with a lot of self-love, then we start to burn out. And that is the consuming of our own energy. It's like when people extract from the earth in order to make fossil fuels, right? We do that with our own bodies, like extract from our bodies in order to produce more fuel that is not sustainable. So I would say that if you are energetically operating in a way that is not sustainable, like, is the way that you're being today sustainable for the next 50 years of your life? If it's not, then you're, you're borrowing your precious energy that is irreplaceable in order to create a momentary result. And there's huge costs to that. I mean, this is, this is a lot, uh, you know, early infertility, burnout, like women that lose the connection with their pleasure, with their feminine essence, with their orgasm often is because they're moving too fast. They're pushing too hard. They're forcing things instead of actually allowing the natural flow of their energy to lead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, amazing. Just barometer to look at of uh, and I mean even as a man you know like is it sustainable am I gardening my own energy and that that's really important I'm in a season right now personally of shifting into that because I have consumed my own energy to push to to produce more to go 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 and do all the things that ironically I was thinking I was being more of a man for doing but it made me uh very fragile as a man because I was burnt out all the time um, and so, you know, putting the first things first, which is your life force, which is what we're talking about here, uh, is very, very important. And I'm just reiterating that that's also uh, seen in the masculine as well in my own experience. Yeah, I also went through a burnout that was pretty significant at one point in my life where I was pushing and creating and I was in my, you know, I was in my mid 20s and I, I have a lot of energy naturally. Like I have a lot of vital energy and I was like, oh, it will never run out. It'll never run out. And I, I kept going and going. And I remember one day where I basically collapsed, like basically laid down on the floor and started crying and was like, I literally cannot even think about the next thing that I was supposed to do right now. And my partner, bless him, picked me up, put me in the bathtub and and just like sat down with me and was like, it's okay to slow down. It, it's okay to rest. Like started sharing with me that I could relax. And at that time I needed that permission from someone else. 
I, I wasn't able to give myself that permission yet. And I'm grateful to have been with someone who could offer me that permission. And that is such an important permission that we can offer each other in intimate relationship is like really holding what serves life and what serves life force as more important than whatever perceived goals that we have. Because if it's a not, not a sustainable path to get there, then it's going to collapse and fall apart anyway. And I have found that through, as I've learned to allow myself to relax and receive and let life flow through me, that the goal that I had that I was working so hard to achieve is like a little tiny river like a little tiny trickle, like a dried up river that I'm like working so hard at. And when I really let that go and serve the life force inside of me, really operate with like what is in service of my life force, then life brings gushing waterfalls of energy my way. Life brings more than what I could have ever imagined. Coming back to um, calling in a man, right? As you mentioned that earlier, mm -hmm. that happened for me. Like the right man for me showed up when I let go of trying to force all the little goals to happen and just allowed the waterfall of energy to move through me, which then manifests in your life as radiance, manifests in your life as magnetism. And that is ultimately attractive. That's ultimately what the right kind of man is looking for. He does not care about a woman who has checked off all of the boxes on her goals and her to-do list. He cares about a man that he gets to feel her radiance, that he gets to take a, a little, a, a little that, that's a sanctuary where he gets to take a break from everything in his life to be in connection with the deep feminine. Like that's what he cares about. So actually embodying that in your everyday life is a more effective way of calling in a man than like, you know, killing yourself swiping on dating apps for two hours a day. Like go walk around as the fully radiant embodied woman that you are and he will find you. Yeah. That's for sure that, and, and, you know, I think, I think on that What's really wrong? quick, yeah, but on that real quick, I think there's, there's yeah. the fear though, I think for a lot of women and even any, any human would be like, okay, but if I am my fullest self, I'm going to attract stuff like everything, which is also maybe people or attention that I don't want. Um, so as we're talking about embodying being in this garden and being that juicy orgasmic self. Um, how do you then also navigate the attention that you get from that? Because it is so rare and it is so life giving um, that, yes, that's what the right man is looking for. But then it's also like I, I'm just hearing voices of, of some women might be saying like, well, I don't want to like get attention from that guy type of a thing. Or I, I, you know, like preserving their energy type of fear. What would you have to say around that? So there's two vectors here one vector is what we've been speaking to of magnetism radiance feminine essence pleasure embodiment arrows and as that grows the other vector also needs to grow and that is standards maturity discernment a healthy nervous system that knows what is right for you and what is not right for you the ability within yourself to embody a boundary in such a way that your energy communicates that boundary without you needing to like come out with a sword and like start setting boundaries all over your life. If you need to set boundaries all over your life, that's because you were previously not embodying boundaries. When boundaries are embodied, it sends a signal out the same way your radiance and magnetism and feminine essence sends a signal out. It's just a different side of 
the essence, a different aspect of feminine awakening. And I'm glad you brought this up because often I see teachers of the feminine, coaches of the feminine that go in one direction or the other. And it's either all about boundaries and standards and like you are a high value woman and you know, you, you deserve everything in the world. And, and th these women are like up in an ivory tower and there's like an electric fence and a moat with alligators around them. And like, no man can reach you there. Or there's like the woman that's like a ripped screen door where there's no boundaries and she's so magnetic and she's just, it's just oozing. It's just like a tangled Christmas lights that are just like sprawling all over the place. And anyone has access and anyone can come in and feed on and these are extremes, but ultimately there's an integration of your standards, your boundaries, your maturity, and your magnetism, your radiance, and your essence. And when this comes together, there we have an integrated woman. And that's really the path that I want to invite women to walk. I absolutely love that. And I know that you had mentioned too that you're... Uh doing a lot of work in, in supporting women in becoming that integrated woman. Could you share a little bit more about some, some of the offerings you have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing that I have always is a membership. And the membership is easy to come into, entry level, um, all levels, all levels work. And this is really in some of what we've been talking about with becoming a woman who embodies both your essence, magnetism, and also your st standards and boundaries and maturity. And really that path of becoming an integrated, turned on, embodied woman, that's inside of the Awakened Woman membership. And we meet bi-weekly and there's a lot, there's a whole library of 40 hours of content and lots of practices. And it's very embodiment-based as all of my work is very embodiment-based. And for women who are wanting to awaken more of their arrows, awaken more of their orgasmic potential, awaken their cervical orgasm, their capacity to be in pleasurable, blissful, ecstatic orgasmic states inside of the bedroom and outside of the bedroom, just walking around in life as a more turned on, radiant woman while also learning how to communicate your desires so they come out as an invitation to your partner when you're sharing about your intimate desires and what you want more of and maybe even some boundaries that you have, like how to hold that in a way that is relational and loving and that the masculine can hear what you're saying as an opportunity instead of as a criticism or demand. That's like a sweet spot that I really love uh, working with women on. Um, for that path, I have a free live training called Gush, which is about unlocking your orgasmic potential. And that is coming up on September 24th. There will also be a replay for that. And then that leads into an eight week uh, guided live journey called Pussy Portal, which is going deeper into all of that for women who really want to go deeper into that. So those are the the things that I have available currently. And then also I post a lot of stuff on, on Instagram and I'm constantly looking at how I can find the, the, the paradox that includes multiple truths. Like I, I feel like there's a lot of content that for me feels one-sided or um, like it's about one thing, but then forgets 10 other things that are also essential. So part of, if you would like to follow me and be in connection with me, like part of the conversation I'm wanting to have is how can we be more inclusive of multiple perspectives and awarenesses and hold multiple truths at one time, finding the paradox that ultimately leads to greater truth and wisdom. So I do that inside of things like pleasure and orgasm. And that's why I think that orgasm and our erotic life is a great place to alchemize dense emotional energy. It's like I want to find ways that we can be more holistic as, as human beings and, and not just like 
go off on different tangents thinking that that thing's the truth and this thing's the truth without forgetting like the deeper whole. And so that's the kind of content and stuff that I like to to play with in conversations that I want to continue to have. The world needs more of that, that's for sure. So thank you for having that conversation. <laughs> And uh, yeah, everything's going to be posted down below in the show notes for anybody who wants to dive into our world even more into the, any of those offerings. And I just want to say thank you for sharing your heart and your wisdom with me on the show today. This was absolutely phenomenal. And um, I, I could only assume just a glimmer of the work that you do. So I really want to encourage everybody to check out everything that's down below in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much for having me on, Kevin. You're very welcome.